All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, welcome to King's Maritime History Seminars, uh, organized as always by the British Commission for Maritime uh, History, hosted here in the Department of War Studies by the Department of Law and Naval History Unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War, and organized with the support of the Society for Nautical Research and Lloyd's uh, Register. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Rachel uh, Blackman, who's a, a familiar uh, face, uh, a supporter of the seminar of long standing, usually sits over there, but is now standing here, which is good news for uh, all of us. Uh, Rachel's interests are are varied, I know that. They go back to Alfred and uh, King Alfred, and they go uh, all the way to and beyond, no doubt, uh, the Napoleonic Wars. But it's it's those very wars uh, that Rachel is going to speak to us uh, uh, about appropriately here in the War Studies Department. And there's no need for further ado from me. So I will hand over uh, with gratitude to you, uh, Rachel. Anybody who wants to ask a question can raise a hand. Um, and that's probably the best best way uh, to do it. So many thanks, Rachel, and over to you. Should we share screen? And we'll share screen. Okay. Anyone else? So hello everyone. I'm Rachel Blackman Rogers, and I'm a PhD candidate at King's College. And today I'm going to be presenting my thesis, which looks at the British response to unlimited war with France during the Revolutionary Wars. And although these wars lasted for nine years, I'm going to be looking at this particular period because this was when Britain realised that it was engaged in an unlimited war. And that meant the necessary expansion of executive power to extract the resources needed to power Britain's fiscal naval machinery. And for that to happen, relationships between Britain's institutions needed to be renegotiated and redefined. To do this, Britain embarked upon two key processes. One was a strategic evolution and the other a cultural transformation. And these two processes were symbiotic. They depended upon each other for their success. And their aims were to secure the nation from the unlimited threat of invasion and deliver national consensus. Historiographically, this period isn't really seen this way. Cultural and social historians tend to see repression and government tyranny, and military and strategic historians see failure and paralysis in the face of French aggression. And what this thesis is offering is a different perspective. Now, I've chosen this image here uh, to illustrate my entire thesis, and some of you may recognize it as the blowing up of the French ship L'Orient at the Battle of the Nile in 1798. And I didn't choose it just because it's part of the uh, period I'm looking at, but because the intensity of that explosion to me is really representative of the shock waves these wars sent across Europe. And so I thought I'd begin by talking about how I'm going to structure my argument. I'm going to first talk about the revolution controversy, which uh, sets the scene for how Britain interpreted the revolution and therefore how they entered the war at the beginning. We then reached the point at which everything changed. The French Navy were defeated in the middle of 1794 and unlimited war was revealed. So Britain began to embark on a process in order to secure itself from the unlimited threat of invasion. And delivering that would be His Majesty's Navy and the Bank of England. In order to deliver that, a cultural transformation within the Navy was required. And in addition to deliver national consensus, opposition to the war needed to be contained. So that in the end, there was consensus behind a strategy of overthrow by seven, the end of 1798. And I think this quote from Julian Corbett really um, eloquently uh, states how that relationship between people's beliefs about war and strategy were so intimately connected. And Britain didn't enter this war united in either its beliefs about it or in what it thought it might achieve. And that would have consequences. And some of that originated in the revolution controversy. 
uh, when people are looking at contemporary events that they don't really, it's quite difficult to understand something that's really new. And so it's quite common to use something familiar to understand it. And in this case, factions within Britain claimed the revolution as the direct descendant of the glorious revolution of 1688. They therefore saw it as the peaceful containment of a tyrannical monarch and the distribution of executive power into the estates and assembly. Um, and that was quite appealing. And this, the chubby gentleman on the right, Charles James Fox, uh, the leader of the Whig opposition, believed he had been witnessing the abuse of executive power for over a decade from George III and William Pitt. And at the onset of war, there was a slight expansion of executive power in order to gear up Britain's military establishment. And to his horror, uh, Charles Fox believed that the 1688 settlement had been thrown out the window with the baby in the bathwater. He believed the only way to retrieve those constitutional rights was through peace and a change of ministry. And if he was really lucky, the revolution might cross the channel and George III could be gone too. The only man offering an alternative to this was Edmund Burke, the other gentleman seen there. And he was an Irish Whig politician and philosopher. And what he believed he was witnessing was a state sanctioned bonfire of French culture and identity reconstructed on the radical ideologies of the Enlightenment and the Revolution. And that therefore any war with France would be necessarily belligerent, expansive, and unrestrained. And this narrative not only divided the Whig opposition within Parliament, it divided the nation as intellectuals and commercial circles tried to understand what was happening. And that meant Britain was unable to deal intellectually with the revolution. They found it difficult to decipher French aims or to analyze the uh, a nihilistic rhetoric that was emerging from France directed explicitly at Britain. Wars with France in the recent past had been limited economic wars and Britain was also aware that the revolution had decimated the French economy and political stability. Didn't look likely that France could sustain any war effort for any period of time. Britain therefore made a critical mistake. It believed itself engaged in a limited economic war, and that dictated its strategy. It believed it could push France's broken economy over a precipice quite quickly and easily, and it could just be left to implode quietly within its borders. But that wasn't the war that France was engaged in. Republican France was fighting for its legitimacy within Europe and on the world stage, and it would do so till it was exhausted. So Britain began embarking on a limited maritime strategy that had both naval and economic objectives. Firstly, it was aimed at the key uh, European French fleets at Brest and Toulon. There was an uh, expedition to the West Indies with both economic and naval objectives. It was designed to deny France access to its colonial wealth, pushing its economy further towards the edge. But it would also deny France access to its naval resources in the region, manpower and shipping. And it would also reassure British merchants back, in, back at home and hopefully stimulate the circulation of credit. There was a, uh, an expedition into Flanders as usual for the purposes of national security and a reasonably vigorous diplomatic strategy designed to guide allies that, we were, that Britain was funding and also prevent neutral nations from becoming hostile because the longer the war went on and the Navy disrupted neutral trade, the more likely those neutral nations were to become hostile. And at the same time, the government was reinforcing its influence in Parliament and the judiciary. It courted the Portland Whigs, who were a faction of the opposition, who supported the idea of war and rejected that uh, interpretation by Fox. They replaced key positions within the judiciary with those who would support the war and would more vigorously prosecute revolutionary sympathizers. They tried to close down French influence and interference 
And they did this through uh, legislation. So the Aliens Act and the suspension of habeas corpus meant they could deport those <coughs> emigres without trial. And they also um, directed some of this at the London Corresponding and Revolutionary Societies who were in direct contact with the French governing body and assembly through the libel acts and the suspension of habeas corpus. The ministry also sought to increase the reliability and secrecy of some of its funding and strategy. And they did this by slipping clauses into the regular loan and exchequer bill acts of 1793 and 1794. And these did two things. One, they allowed the bank to provide funds to government without parliamentary consent and therefore without parliamentary debate, which would be reported in the newspapers. And secondly, they forced the bank to honour treasury bills issued by the government on its own security. And this was a form of arbitrary credit. And when the opposition and bank discovered this, they were incensed at this arrant abuse of power. They also sought to protect the economy. They issued a five pound note, which would insulate the economy to an extent from any invasion threat and also ease the circulation crisis that naturally started at the onset of the war. And they obviously banned all commerce with France. And for consensus, they were reinforcing a sense of a maritime identity, reinforcing the idea of naval superiority um, and that uh, the war was in safe hands. And this little cartoon by James Gilray came out in 1793. And I'm guessing he was a bit anti-war and seems to be saying that the glamour of war would quickly change to horror. And then everything changed at the glorious 1st of June in 1794. The Toulon fleet had already uh, been dealt with in December 1793 by the Mediterranean fleet who had burnt a third of it as it withdrew from a brief occupation. They then occupied Corsica to prevent its, it being rebuilt. So there was a lot of pressure on the Channel Fleet to deal with the premier French fleet at Brest. And I think that uh, pressure is really captured by that excerpt from the Times as it began to build. And Admiral Howe, who was commanding the Channel Fleet, had spent this time devising new tactics that would increase the decisiveness of any naval engagement. He was looking to create a decisive <coughs> melee exploiting the advantages of superior British gunnery, seamanship, and a naval culture of mutually supporting squadrons. Intelligence was received of a grain convoy crossing the Atlantic that was presumed to be vital to support the Committee of Public Safety, the French governing body. And Howe was ordered to detach a strong squadron and pursue that convoy and to sail the, the Channel Fleet in support, which he did. When the Brest fleet then sailed, they lured him out to the East Atlantic and he followed because this was a golden and rare opportunity to deal with that French fleet. The battles took place over a series of five days and although they were e fairly evenly matched in numbers, they weren't matched in experience for the revolution had decimated the French Navy, especially the officer corps. And in fact, the French Admiral Villarreal Joyeuse had complained that out of his fleet, he had only a handful of experienced gunners. By the last day, Howe had managed to cut the line in seven places and create that decisive melee, and the results are telling. A battle of this level of decisiveness hadn't been seen in over a hundred years. Historiographically, this battle is often seen as a tactical success, but a strategic failure, because the grain convoy 16 days later arrived in Brest. But actually, its arrival made no difference. It didn't save the Committee of Public Safety, and it soon imploded and became a directory, and just pausing to execute Robespierre and his cronies on the way. Howe's job was done. He defeated the French Navy, he brushed his hands off and went ashore for the last time. And everyone expected France to sue for peace, but they didn't. And instead, they tried to construct a maritime federation. They wanted to escalate the threat to Britain. Britain took a deep breath and the ministry consolidated its parliamentary majority by assimilating 
the Portland Whigs, not only into the cabinet, but into their back benches. This was not just a ministerial war. This was a national war. This was an unlimited war and at stake was Britain's political survival. There were also changes immediately instigated within the Navy. The Transport Board was created, relieving the Navy of the burdens of providing army transport in order to improve dockyard efficiency. And by the end of the year, Lord Chatham, William Pitt's brother, who was leading the Admiralty, was replaced with the young Whig, Earl Spencer. Chatham had become a target for the opposition um, and the city were petitioning for his removal, unwilling to sustain the commercial losses. And there was also cries of nepotism and that Pitt was ignoring the incompetency of, incompetency of Chatham because he was his brother. Strategically, France began 1795 by taking the Dutch Navy and reinvigorating their war effort into the Pyrenees, knocking Spain out of the war by the middle of the year. Although they became neutral, it was only a matter of time before they became an enemy. And this cartoon by James Gilray really um, summarizes the fact that Britain was now on a precipice and the real danger was the opposition. On her knees in the front is Britannia, having thrown down her sword and shield and crown before the monster of the French Republic. And behind her stand the radical Whigs, Charles James Fox, Richard Sheridan and the Earl of Stanhope. And they're holding out the keys of Britain's security, quite clearly labeled Bank of England, surrender of the Navy and the destruction of parliament. And the opposition was growing the membership to the London Corresponding Society was growing. The bank refused to fund the loan to Austria. The king was attacked. Uh, grain was short because there'd been failed harvests and due to the war, hungry people were angry people and there was rioting. And the government had to intervene in grain markets, which was really unpopular with many capitalists who saw this as an unnecessary intervention in free markets. And they also passed a series of legislation. Uh, the Seditious Meetings Act banned meetings of more than 50 people. The Treason Act made inflammatory speech uh, treasonable and habeas corpus remained suspended. But in reality, not many people were prosecuted and even fewer imprisoned. It was more a symbolic line in the sand of what was a tolerable level of opposition. And so by 1796, with the bank not funding, allies, the war in the continent was beginning to collapse on land and His Majesty's Navy was beginning to face both French land power and a maritime federation that was being constructed. And Bonaparte launched his uh, Italian campaign. And part of this was to separate Austria from the alchemy of the British fleet in the Mediterranean and eventually drive the fleet entirely out of the sea where it could influence Southern Europe. And there were definitely maritime objectives to this campaign because Bonaparte systematically worked his way down the east and west coasts of Italy, taking Vardo, Genoa, Spezia, Leghorn, Civita Vecchia, Ancona, Ravenna, Pescaro, and the mouth of the Po River at Chioggia, Venice and Trieste. And then when Spain declared war in October, the British had, were forced to leave and the center of gravity for British maritime power shifted north of Cape Finisterre. The naval war had to be stepped up. Britain and France remembered that a maritime federation had defeated Britain during the American War of Independence. And these orders represent that escalation. Not only were they being ordered to destroy the enemy, they were being told to create the opportunities to take risks and if those risks didn't pay off, they were being promised immunity from prosecution. For some admirals, this was in complete contradiction to what they believed was expected of them. And for others, such as Nelson, this was a welcome release from a limited scope of action. And His Majesty's Navy stepped up and delivered. As you can see from the quote from Admiral Morard de Gaulle, by the middle of 1797, it was already beginning to become clear that no maritime federation was going to bend Britain to French political will. The first battle was the Battle of St. Vincent, 
And this was a battle with 15 British ships against 27 Spanish, a considerable risk, but the Spanish uh, war uh, machine hadn't fully mobilized. And so actually it was about six Spanish ships against the entire British fleet. That didn't matter because it was a decisive victory. Um, and in fact, Nelson had elevated it by taking two ships with one boarding and created a, a, a made a statement about the levels of British aggression. And it enabled Britain to blockade Cadiz afterwards and lock the rest of the Spanish fleet in the Mediterranean. Following this was the Battle of Camperdown on the 11th of October, 1797. And this was a fairly even match. Uh, there were 13 British ships against 16 Dutch, and it was British quality offset by Dutch quantity, and the Dutch were formidable enemies. Admiral Duncan sought to overwhelm the Dutch rear, and then he had to break the line in order to avoid the dangers of being lured onto the shoals with the Dutch having such a shallow draft and prevent them from escaping. And you can see from the sheer attrition of ships and manpower, how devastating that was. And the French Federation had now been destroyed and defeated. The French began dismantling their naval resources for a guerre de course, which was a statement of British superiority in the seas. This actually came to a juddering halt uh, shortly after by December, coincidentally or not, with the arrival of Bonaparte in Paris and where he began to consider how to defeat Britain. And he came up with three options. One was invade Northern Germany, which the Battle of Camperdown had already stopped. One was to invade, but the Navy had already secured Britain from the threat of invasion and the bank would as well, which we'll see in a minute, and to invade Egypt. And so that led to the culmination of this process at the Battle of the Nile. As many of you know, the French anchored very close to the shore in Abu Kabir Bay, and probably only Nelson would have arrived at sunset and snuck in between the shore and the ships and doubled the line and completed that annihilation. I've included the Battle of Tory Island of October 1798, simply because I think it continues to demonstrate the British attempts to clear the seas of all enemy naval power. This was a small squadron that had deposited a small body of troops in Ireland to try and reinvigorate the rebellion. And as they left, they were pursued by John Borlase Warren and his squadron who pursued them over a number of days and took seven of the nine ships and 3,000 seamen. So by 1798, Britain was able to extend its strategy right onto the enemy coasts. They were blockading Cadiz, Brest, Le Havre, and Texel. And this, the black line on the northern and Atlantic coasts demonstrates where small aggressive squadrons were patrolling and preventing naval supplies from entering those ports, and in some cases, economic supplies as well. For at Cadiz, Admiral John Jervis was trying to create local economic pressure to force out the remains of the Spanish fleet and so he could destroy it. And at La Havre, there were attacks going right down the mouth of the Seine towards Paris, putting even greater pressure on Paris, whilst Nelson was hunting for Bonaparte in the Mediterranean, and the success of that battle would turn the Mediterranean into a British theater. It was as much as British sea power could possibly do. And this quote from the Morning Chronicle at the top tells us that the nation was well aware that they were rescued from the threat of invasion, but France could then maintain the war and that would just put us to extraordinary expense. So at the same time, the bank was also uh, being uh, resistant to the war and that would have to be overcome. Throughout 1795, under the governorship of Daniel Giles, they began to resist funding the war. This forced the minister into the markets to fund it. And at the same time, the bank restricted paper circulation and this made it very difficult for him to secure credit. So they were trying to bend the ministry to their will in order to uh, push Britain to peace. Eventually private investors under the consortium led by Boyd and Benfield contracted the loan at the end of 1795 under an open process of competition. 
but because the bank had made it so difficult to secure credit, they then contracted the 1796 loans under a closed process, and that allowed the opposition to accuse the Ministry of corruption. By September 1796, the private investors were struggling to pay for the loan, and so William Pitt and Henry Dundas, the Secretary of War, gave them a temporary bridging loan of £40,000 from the Navy's money because Dundas was the treasurer of the Navy and had access, and that was why he was impeached in 1805. It was clear that this couldn't go on and the bank needed to be reconciled. Pitt began quite gently. He's used peace negotiations to lift the markets and stimulate some sort of credit and to dispel opposition to the war by revealing the necessity and levels of French aggression. He used the King's speech to fuse together the economy and the Navy to show to them, to demonstrate what the foundation of British security was to the bank. By November, fortune suggested that something more desperate might be possible. There was nothing like a good invasion threat to create a run on the banks, and there was intelligence that an invasion force was gathering in Brest. They would also need silver in order to try and break the cash circulation from its dependency on gold. And they proposed to send 150,000 pounds to China in order to get some silver back. But actually the Navy delivered and HMS Emerald um, took a prize in the Tagus that was loaded with 4 million Spanish silver dollars, all very convenient. The uh, force from Brest tried to land in Ireland in December and then from January and February, the government took several steps. Firstly, it insulated the Navy from the coming crisis by reforming the payment of naval bills. Secondly, Pitt proposed to the bank that they reduce their paper circulation further. And what this chart shows is the point of the financial crisis on the 26th of February and that sharp drop in the paper circulation. At the same time, the government were accumulating cash. So the economy was effectively being stalled. And then they worked on the invasion threat to drive it into crisis. And contemporaries looking on were very upset and believed that the government were deliberately fanning that invasion threat. And when you analyze that through opposition and government newspapers, it's pretty clear that something was definitely going on and the government was doing its best. By the 24th of February, the bank was really concerned and they asked Pitt to intervene and sources suggest he was prepared. He suggested a secret parliamentary committee to examine the bank's resources and that meant their resources would be laid before parliament and published in the newspapers. Everyone would know that Britain could afford the war. It was planned to attach Bank of England notes to the security of Parliament, and this would give credit greater strength and allow borrowing at lower rates of interest. And he suggested a meeting with all the key merchants in the city to ask them to pledge their support. And in fact, he met with the top bankers the day before the crisis. On the 26th, the Order of Council was issued suspending cash payments, and the economy was insulated from the threat of invasion because you could only change notes for other notes. And as this uh, other Gilray cartoon clearly makes clear, um, and this ruddy faced gentleman in the brown coat, it doesn't really matter if you invade because I've got my paper money and you can take my gold. A couple of days later, pledges of support began to emerge from guilds, corporations, banks. However, it's notable that the Mansion House pledge of support was missing a third of the bank's directors, including the governor. The bank had no choice and they issued one and two pound notes and they also had to restamp Spanish dollars as legal tender. The result was a permanent shift towards a more public role for the bank and the increased liquidity in the financial system remained and the economy boomed. This also enabled unfunded borrowing, which was needed in order to pay the unpredictable and very large naval bills. By 1798, income tax was introduced to complement the reforms, providing a sustained budget and ruling out hyperinflation. And what this cartoon shows is that forceful courtship that Pitt 
went into with the Bank of England, forcing them to open their coffers, no matter how reluctant. And so Britain's fiscal naval machinery was funded. Oh, I seem to be missing a slide, um, but it hadn't been manned. No way, that's gone. Um, so Parliament had voted for an additional, one, additional 100,000 seamen in 1795. The bank was blocking paying them, but there was also the difficulty of finding them. And so the bank invested considerable resources in how they recruited, and they'd established a new system called the Quota Acts. And this was because of problems with local judiciaries accepting the impress. And what Admiral Pringle de described when he was sent to Scotland to recruit men for the North Seas fleet was that there were at least 3,000 skilled seamen in the region, but only a handful were coming through the impress because local magistrates refused to support the impress warrants. They saw the impress as the expansion of executive power eroding their own local authority. And what the Quota Acts did was they enabled um, local uh, judiciaries to raise the money for bounties. Um, and that alleviated some of the friction. Historians see these acts as of limited success. They drove about 5% of recruitment during this period, but it was, their deter it was a demonstration of that determination to alleviate the friction. There were other acts to increase volunteers and about 80% of the Navy was uh, driven by volunteers. Uh, married men could allocate wages to their family. Uh, ships companies could um, allocate certain men or a number of men to go in the Navy rather than have them unpredictably lifted out of ships. And the Admiralty were also changing technology and reducing the number of men needed. There's a lot of interchange between the Admiralty and captains and commanders where they're told to stop whining about the lack of men because they actually don't need that many anymore. The Admiralty's changed the numbers required and they just needed to get on with it. And there was also a drive to create a home defence force. And over this period, about 80,000 men were recruited for home defence. And this released naval resources for offensive operations out of home waters. And so we come to the cultural transformation that was within the Navy to deliver this strategy. Um, and this was done under the leadership of Earl Spencer, who you can see on this slide. And under his leadership, the Navy was systematically and culturally professionalized. They introduced Howe's system of tactics and signals. They introduced Admiral John Jervis's system of discipline. They also instituted Admiral Middleton's administrative reforms in 1796 designed to maintain powerful fleets and remove a lot of the bureaucracy from administration and corruption. They made some efforts to replace patronage with merit as the basis of career advancement uh, so that more able officers would be placed where they were needed. And they broke up naval factionalism by controlling the authority of commanders in chief. And that's what Admiral Bridport is particularly cranky about in this quote. After waiting all that time to be promoted to the most important person in the Navy, he found that it wasn't quite what he thought it was going to be, and how it had a lot more power. Uh, critically, the ministry were exterminating anything that the opposition could use against them, any form of factionalism, and there was seen to be a crown party and a pit faction within the Navy that needed to be uh, exterminated. And the Navy was notoriously resistant to change and there were critics. The historian John Morrow suggests that these three admirals were forced to resign because of a personality clash with Spencer and a clash of wills, but actually it looks much more likely that it's because they voiced public criticism of the management of the Navy. First to go was Admiral Lord Hood, and he had returned from the Mediterranean to try and uh, get reinforcements for his theater he was also a visible symbol of the pit faction within the Navy and would often use Pitt's authority to get his own way. He was promptly dumped from the Board of Admiralty in March and in May he was ordered to strike his flag after he publicly criticised Spencer's management. Second was Charles Middleton and he was an obstruction to most of the changes that Spencer wanted to put in place. 
He particularly liked to use the king's authority to push through any changes and Pitt couldn't really afford to have accusations that the expanding executive power were held by the king. So that made him a target and he found himself increasingly isolated from Spencer's inner cabinet. He criticized Spencer publicly and his resignation was accepted. Last of all was William Cole Wallace. And as part of this whole renegotiation and uh, of relationships between institutions, the army and the navy had come into um, had come into a clash, and the admirals had revolted as the army tried to usurp the navy's seniority. Cornwallis was seen as the figurehead of that, and when he was appointed commander in chief of the West Indies, he believed it was a punishment and refused to go. He thought it was just the place you went to die, basically. Um, but they persuaded him it was his duty. He set off. Uh, his ship got damaged in a storm. He returned to England and then he refused to go out in a frigate. He said it was beneath his uh, station as a commander in chief and would undermine his authority. Spencer seems to have felt that could have been negotiated, but it was taken out of his hands. The opposition accused Spencer of mismanagement in the House of Lords and it was the talk of London. Cornwallis was promptly court-martialed by the board because it was important to demonstrate that the problem was Cornwallis and not Spencer. Every flag officer in Portsmouth turned out to support Cornwallis and he was acquitted but struck his flag anyway. The loss of these three admirals was significant. They had significant strategic and administrative skills to provide but what was more important at the time was the credibility of the ministry to manage the navy. And in fact, they would all go on to be promoted and Cornwallis and Middleton would return to uh, the fleet, the war later. And it wasn't just the officers, the men as well. I think you all know about the Spithead and Nor and Plymouth mutinies of spring of 1797. Mutiny was a normal process in which the terms and conditions of service were negotiated, but this united action was a, the largest public attack on trust in the government. There were also uh, indications that there was more at work. The vocabulary, the eloquence of the petitions alerted the government that perhaps there was more to this. And if you've read any of the petitions from earlier, they were of a completely different quality and caliber. And one of the petitions was addressed directly to Charles Fox didn't really matter that all the others weren't because that is the one that would have alerted the government to possible external influence. Many commanding officers reported external influence and in May as the mutiny began to radicalize at the Nore, Charles Fox took his opportunity and in a private conversation with the king suggested he change the ministry. He knew the king would never accept himself so he ruled himself out quite obligingly um, his words were echoed a few days later by the crew of the Pompeii who were mutinying and by June the crews themselves were suggesting some form of external influence. Whether it was there or not, the government believed it. Eventually, the mutinies were brought to an end as the city support uh, dissolved when they believed their own interests were being threatened by the mutineers. The mutineers tried to stop commercial ships entering the uh, port of uh, London. But what was important was to re-establish that trust and that visible trust in the, in the ministry and in the war. And eventually they were all back at war and the Battle of Camperdown quickly followed. Oh, there it is. That was my manpower slide. <coughs> and finally, they had to contain the opposition and create, deliver a consensus. And they began by looking at parallel groups that had emerged due to the opposition's powerful arguments. Within the city, the Lord Mayor, Brooke Watson, called for peace and a replacement of the ministry. And this was a fairly significant figure to be doing this in 1797. There was suggestions that the bank and um, the Navy were agreeing with the opposition's arguments at various points. Merchants and bankers set up a parallel group and a group of 35 Whig MPs set themselves as a parallel secret committee looking at the bank. So these needed to be contained. And part of this was done through propaganda 
George Canning had lured the caricaturist James Gilray into the government fold with a £200 a year secret pension in 1796. And he was tasked with not mocking the government or the king and vilifying the opposition and George Canning would feed him stories. They set up publications and used those for uh, pro-war, pro-ministry uh, propaganda. Uh, they also sought to contain the authority of the king in order to diffuse some of their arguments that France and Britain were experiencing the same thing and there was a tyrannical monarch. And they did this by a whole range of uh, means. One of them was that they didn't provide him with much intelligence because he complained that his only source of news was the newspapers. Um, and they also refused to confirm any of his sons in the positions they wanted at the head of the army and the navy and in Ireland. And then um, there was also the naval strategy that was able to contain some of the opposition. It was actually very difficult when victory culture flooded a newspaper and the news environment to try and make an argument that the Navy were being mismanaged and the war was going badly. And what this graph uh, is trying to show is uh, the purple line shows the point at which the news of these battles broke within Britain. And this is looking at just the Morning Chronicle, the opposition's propaganda newspaper. And I'm looking at the content they published about anti-ministry agenda, um, anti-war, and the volume of it over the two weeks before the news of the battles broke and the one week after. And you can see that from the Battle of Camperdown and the Battle of the Nile, it had quite a deflecting um, impact. And you can also see that between 1797, the Battle of St. Vincent and 1798, it had been reduced by about 75%. So the opposition's argument was just becoming quieter and quieter. And then finally, the government invested considerable resources in creating unity and consensus. And victory culture certainly powered some of this. They supported loyalist uh, um, groups. They also, uh, there was, they made more and more of each victory. There were greater rewards, illuminations, fireworks, but it also permeated British culture. Women would change their fashions after the Battle of Camperdown, they all took to wearing tartan because Admiral Duncan was Scottish. They would wear oak leaves and laurel leaves. Um, songs were written, battle scenes were recreated and tagged onto the end of pantomimes and plays. Um, the National Gallery of Maritime Art was proposed in 1795. And at the same time, the Rotunda in Leicester Square opened its doors to the panorama. And that's what this diagram shows. And this was a huge, um, a, a huge painting of, in 3D. It was going to be an immersive experience and it was particularly used to display naval battles. And people would pay a shilling and go inside, go up the platforms, and then they'd be immersed in what was the sea battle, connecting it directly to the nation. In fact, it was supposed to be so realistic that the queen was apparently seasick when she visited and a dog jumped off the platform to save a drowning man. In December 1797, the French Maritime Federation had been defeated and there was a celebratory mass in St Paul's. It was a recreation of an Elizabethan style celebration after the Armada that had been used frequently throughout the 18th century, particularly by Queen Anne, and it fused together the ideology of a Protestant sea power supported by monarch, bank, parliament, government and the city. And it was celebrating the victories of the glorious 1st of June, the Battle of St Vincent and the Battle of Camperdown. And so by the end of 1798, Britain had, was secure from the unlimited threat of invasion and a consensus had been delivered behind a strategy of overthrow. Executive power had expanded the fiscal and naval machinery of British war had been fully mobilized and Britain was sufficiently united. The French Maritime Federation had been defeated. Uh, one of the most uh, convincing accounts I've heard of British um, success over um, Napoleonic France, um, 
because it's easy to forget um, you know, the transformational effect of uh, war on that kind of scale and uh, all the requirements that are uh, needed uh, on all the different fronts uh, for victory. Um, I'll open it up for questions from um, anywhere. Um, I look for you can raise your hands electronically or um, physically. Yes. Yeah, well, thank you, Rachel. Um, there's a, a few things I thought, but I'm particularly interested in this. Um, on one of your slides, you showed uh, Admiral Ronald de Gaulle's in May 97. Yes. And he, he apparently said that Britain alone does not recognize the French Republic. Yes. They French Admiral, I think. Yes. Yeah. Now, this is quite interesting. I, was it the case that, I mean, uh, uh, if you know, that at the time the French Republic really felt it had no other enemy? I think, I, I don't know whether, I think what motivated his quote was in fact two things. Firstly, he felt that France weren't using their navy properly. He'd actually commanded the invasion force to Ireland in 1796. It was such a disaster. And he felt that uh, the French Republic simply wasn't using its French, it wasn't funding its navy, it wasn't using it properly. So part of it was that he felt there was no way they were so going to be taken on, but he also the, could see the aggression levels coming from, from Britain. And that quote comes from a letter that he had written privately and was captured by the British in Tenerife. So in that was really just a frustration to the frustrating officer who's not getting his opportunity, the opportunity he wants to sort of... I think it, well, the whole letter actually goes on to describe how, how Britain is dominating the seas and it was a bit it was a bit of both there was a little bit of um he wasn't very happy with what was happening with the french navy but he also just couldn't see that there was going to be anything they could do about I, I, it i thought they got quite a few enemies on the continent actually. yeah i don't think he was thinking that way <laughs> um, uh, you? um i think your 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 talk but um in, in the wars of the uh, 17th and uh, the rest of the 18th centuries, um, the uh, concept was to maintain the balance of power. Um, would you say what this, what we've been talking about, is the turning point whereby the concept of war becomes victory rather than balance? No. No, in fact, I think it says almost the opposite, because Britain has secured its own safety and from the threat of France imposing its political will, and now what it's fighting for is that balance of power in Europe. It's not fighting for the destruction. Well, yes, but the point of it is to uh, ensure that France don't dominate Europe. Yeah, it's not the elimination so, of France either, is it? It's not yeah, I mean, the destruction the, of France. No. no. So Britain saved herself by her exertions, and she'll save Europe by her example. I'm sorry. Wasn't it? Wasn't, didn't Pitt actually say something about Britain saving herself by her exertions? Save Europe by her example. I don't know. I, I haven't seen that. I'm not sure when, but around about then. He did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pitt certainly said that. I think rather later. Yeah. I think what's revealing in all of this is when we get to the end of the arc of the revolution. Many of the same people, not to get completely dead, uh, but many of the same people are still in significant office. Prime Minister, the political opinion, significant cabinet minister in Pitt and Britain, and he's been right through this experience. He has actually been there when the Bastille was destroyed. So the man has set both policy and executive policy there when the Bastille was destroyed. What he's doing is in many ways unraveling all of that creation of this warfare state, which has been a key part on such affairs as the arms race. Arms race, likewise, human government has great interest. So we're seeing the arc of this, and what the British do in 1814 is they rehabilitate France. What they're frightened of isn't France, it's what the French have been doing. 
So it's a war against the French Revolution being exported to other countries, particularly Britain, but the rest of Europe went forward. And then it's a war against French imperialism on the Republic being exported to other countries, in particular what we now call Belgium. The whole purpose of the war in Europe is Britain is to get the French out of Belgium and install something that looks like it. They don't want it to be in Europe, they want Europe not to be dominant or Spanish. It's called French imperialism to be corrected. So the days of the Bertie, the Chinabilities, the old shell estuary where they can launch a very rapid invasion into Britain. So the key moment for the British in this is the French invade Belgium. It's no accident that they sent an army to Belgium to build the Belgians. So it, it's a war in which ultimately the prestige of French regimes means that in order to survive domestically, they have to fight the war. And if Britain won't give them peace, they're not going to get the credibility of bringing the war to an end. It's the Napoleon wants to see over the world. Ultimately, Total war, not that it's a way to the total methods, but the total at the end of this war, one regime or other will go down. There will be regime change needed to do restoration balance. The view of what that balance would be in 1914 is uh, as long as it's not what the Tsar wants, we're quite happy with it. And so the British are happy with the rule on the ground effect because that's not what the Tsar wants. That's what it's all about, and it's about keeping the regime, it's about keeping the king, the church, the constitution, pretty much, um, and making big changes. And I think that's exactly what it's all about. And I think it, it, it shifts the way we look at these regimes. And you get above the strategic operational method of it, where things don't go very well quite often, things involving the army. So we're looking at the looking at the larger picture. This is the creation of a warfare state, and it's a conscious process. It's not an accidental or a random process. This is being probably pushed and funded in the middle. And when George Canning recruits Gilray, it's not man doing anything in the government, but it's a set about the opposition. That's a master stroke. Yes. To get Gilray's character, and they're pasted in every window down. That strand uh, and all the way through the mouth. And you don't have to buy them from them, you can see them from them. It's a public thing that has a constitution. It's, and it's just carried on and on and on until they die. So this is a huge amount of grief. And having to write the text to go with this, in a way, it's the literary editor. Separate little boxes, which is very cool at the beginning, it means it was never fully got a grip on what's going on here. He's not made those connections. Uh, he's making those connections. He was a great deal more coherent and explains the outcome much, much better. He's fighting for it. There's certainly one point for the overthrow of France as a state, there might be the overthrow of a particular regime, which is openly and overtly and in a very publicly threatened to destroy. We haven't seen that since the days of Louis XIV, trying to get this Europe back in. And if you want to unify Britain behind the war effort, that's the way to do it. Uh, and the French have a unique habit of always unifying the British behind their own governments. <laughs> it's just a little beyond what the British will tolerate. So, excellent. Really good. Thank you. Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's continuity then, right, in the ultimate aim of war, right, security and its balance, you know, security through balance on the on, on the continent, but there is nevertheless a, a, a transformation, isn't there, you know, as I was just saying, in, in, in the way, and I guess maybe this is what you're getting at, in, in, in the way that the war was approached, and it's approached on all these different levels, and I suppose all wars are, but, you know, this, this is a particular war, and, 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 you know, and I think, well, I don't know. It's a, it's a question. There is a transformational element in the way that war is um, conducted. I would have thought. 
Um, the questions from the room are inaudible, so we'll repeat them from now on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, maybe not. One question that I have, which we'll be able to hear, is, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple question, but everybody seems to have a different answer to it in whichever period they're, they're, they're in. But it's about these invasion scares, and it's about uniting, you know, and, and the political effect in Britain of an invasion scare uh, from France. So how real, how serious, and what effect? Um, so I, I don't think the invasion, for example, of 1796 was necessarily particularly serious. I mean, why would you launch an invasion in the middle of winter in mm. December? Um, and actually, I suspect that the Irish um, in France, Wolf Tone and the like, had been uh, trying to get the directory to back this sort of uh, launching of force and were convincing them that Ireland could be turned. And actually for them, there wasn't much loss because they let Hosh go. And if he didn't come back, that wouldn't be the end of the world. And as it was, they couldn't land. And it was all sort of, um, there was no real rebellious feeling within Ireland at the time. It just doesn't look very credible that this would have worked. Britain had a much, uh, quite a tight control. I mean, it just, it just doesn't look credible. And Lazar Cano actually says that he uses invasion threat in order to manipulate peace negotiations which were going on at the time um, and it's simply a, a tool of war um, you might even see that today I guess with Russia and Ukraine but it's simply a tool of war that uh, that he was using um, and even the little landing in Fishguard was uh, in 1797 was really nonsensical I mean what were 1500 ex-convicts going to really do and some Welsh women beat them up. I mean, it was just, you know, wasn't, and, and even in London, uh, all the paper coverage was laughing. I mean, there was no serious alarm. People just were like, oh my God, what were they really going to do? I can't believe you sent your trash over here. Can't you keep them over in France? And then in 1798, when they sent that body of troops, the rebellion in Ireland was well over. Um, and again, what were 2,000 French troops really going to do? Mm. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think they were ever serious. I think they were just a mechanism of war and used to create pressure and generate alarm and potentially damage British's economy, which was why the bank was insulated, being forced to insulate it. Well, uh, yes. Sorry, but when it yep. back, like, it goes back in time a little bit. Um, you this years coming up to 1798. Um, is there a sense in really that, that, I mean, obviously looking looking at these wars from a, shall we say, this side of the channel, slightly the wrong way round in the sense that they are French wars. It's the French Revolution, which is kind of released forces in France, which the French politicians who have, you know, been sort of here today, gone tomorrow and not really quite have aware of how to sort of ride that particular time that they've unleashed. Um, and then it becomes an aggressive stage itself in a rather shambolic way. Um, and of course, you, 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 like we alluded to the problems of British active currency, but you know, there's absolutely nothing to the problems of French active currency. Um, yes, which know, is why they embarked they, on a campaign of plunder and trying yeah. to take everyone else. When they went into and they reinvigorated their war into Flanders. It wasn't just about acquiring the Dutch fleet. The Bank of Amsterdam was sitting there like yeah. a big uh, golden apple. Unfortunately, Britain had already helped empty it. And all those resources <laughs> were but, not there. But, but, uh, but to a certain extent, what they were doing on this side of the channel, therefore, was adopting, shall we say, a not wholly dissimilar methods of government. Is that in, 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 can I uh, just yeah, translate? I need to summarize the way. It's my job now to, to summarize your question, right? So, yeah. So sorry, for, 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 people, for people at home, right? So I yeah. think I think what was proposed from the from the floor was that the real transformational energy uh, came from uh, uh, France, and that what you were describing were the you know responses to it, and in effect you're looking at these wars uh, from the wrong side because 
Uh, it was in France that we see the really serious financial uh, changes and the real cultural transformations and uh, and strategic transformations and so forth. And it was much much politer than that. You, you put it much more no, less less aggressively than that. But... Much better, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there was certainly some mirror imaging, and that was felt within Britain as well. That some of the changes that were putting through, there was a fear that they were copying what the French had done, particularly with paper money, uh, given the fact that the assignats had completely collapsed, but they were secured on land and property. And that's why they collapsed, because it had no real security, whereas British notes had much greater security through Parliament. You couldn't get anything stronger, and that's why Britain had better credit. But these were just all ideas that were around at the time. And in fact, in many ways, the revolution in some ways continued some of pre-revolution French aims. There'd been a smothered war going on around the globe between the French and British empires since the American War of Independence. And so some of these trends were just drawn into the revolution and into those changes. But yes, Britain definitely certainly hadn't escalated its war in quite this way, but it had fought an unlimited war with France before during the Nine Years' War and the War of the Spanish Succession, 100 years earlier, those also were unlimited wars. So Britain was used to this kind of uh, gearing up for this sort of war. And in fact, the bank was established in 1694 in order to fund unlimited war. And the establishment of the Glorious Revolution, I expect Alan would disagree with me, but the establishment of the Glorious Revolution essentially set up a political process that enabled the expansion of executive power because it gave parliament the freedom of speech and what that meant was that any faction within parliament could bring that expansion of power back to where it was before and it would always be temporary and therefore it could always be tolerated and if i could respond in a, in a, in a, in a less effective uh, uh, way We've had years and decades and piles and piles of books about the effect on France of all of these transformations and the causes of the revolution and the effects of the wars and so on. And it's really refreshing, I think, you know, to see uh, a study, an integrated study of the of, of the responses to it, which is a really necessary uh, balance. So it's, you know, it, it might be the wrong way to look at it in in one sense, but it's the it's it's the necessary no, no, view, no, no, point point of view. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, apart from income tax, what were the long standing changes <laughs> as a result of the war? And of course, I'm taking the war up to 14, 15 as well, in that sense. And very quickly, secondly, what changes in the attitude of the government and to a certain extent society when to the likely duration and intensity when spain allowed itself with france so which was probably a bit of a surprise so the, two, two two questions yeah and one was uh, what was the long term apart from taxation what was the long term effect of all of this and then the second question was the effect of spain uh, in the well, I'll do my best to answer that. So the uh, increase, so the suspension of specie carried on until I think about 1827. Um, and um, so that meant that Britain's economy was no was, was freed from its depend, total dependency on gold. And its economy was able to expand according to the size of its commerce, which continued to increase. Um, I don't know what other types of change you really mean. Do you mean well, political? Really, anything you might... I don't really know, to be honest. I can't really think in my head. Um... Well, I mean, we, we, we could we could we could set you the question, you know, and what on 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 all these different. I mean, you, know, you can answer it culturally or 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 um, you know economically or any changes in war. I and think it, I, I think one thing I would war, say is that actually some of the revolutionary principles began to seep over anyway. Um, mm. That you know people were looking at education of the they were considering um, issues of equality were a massive issue actually because especially in terms of gender there were lots of discussions about you know can we allow women to divorce their husbands won't they just lie and take our money 
Um, and, and this sort of discussion about the role, the roles of genders and 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 people. So equality was quite a big issue, and we also see the abolition of slave, the slave trade, and eventually slavery. And some of that was carried along with those revolutionary ideas and the fact that the revolution had freed some of those slaves. And I think it powered it further. I mean, it was already happening, and I think that process gained greater momentum. And there was pressure to do that even during the war. Um, certainly, Ireland was then united with Britain um, in order to uh, create unity and uh, prevent any more rebellions, uh, which was, you know, which was when we took a pause from the war. Uh, so I think many of the changes that took place actually remained. I think it's a, it's a question you could spend the rest of your life answering. I think you know the effects of of uh, of, of, of all of this. Okay. Yeah. And then the second, the second. Oh, sorry, there was a second question. Uh, I beg your pardon. Um, Spain. Oh, Spain yes. How did they react? Well, the, yeah, they were really horrified. I mean, it was inevitably coming. Um, and I think they were, there was an awareness from very early at the beginning of 1796. William Pitt says, we're going to be fighting this war alone, and I think we can do it. Um, and I think we should. And he's having that debate on how to how he's going to to do that it was an inevitable and in fact for a period there was a period where ships in the Mediterranean were unsure when they met Spanish ships where the war had quite yet been declared because uh, the Spanish might arrive and say well it hadn't been declared when I was last back at shore and oh, well I'm not sure should I be should I be firing on you um, and they had to kind of wait for that official. In fact, I don't think they did wait because they declared war in October. And actually, those orders that I showed were in September. So they were by then thinking, let's just let's just decelerate that before it gets going. And could we wrap up with uh, a final comment? I think that, that last point about Spain's interest because it's the, the great crisis that Korea really takes part of was when Korea declared war in Spain. So that's the second war. Arguing that this would be a sign that the British saw NASA with maritime hegemony and the imperial hegemony, and that this would launch further coalitions against Britain. And this attempt to preemptively knock the Spanish out of the war failed, they were knocked out of the war. But I think going back to this, this question of what changed, well, everything changed. Industrialization changed, there was a step change. When Nelson goes toward the victory in 1805 in September, he goes into the Botman's Culture Harbour and watches rigging block being made by interchanging parts using machine tools. That's the first production of a complex piece of equipment that's anywhere in the world. So those rigging logs are all negotiated in that department. So he sees that. The art of the period, the English stopped going to the continent. Painting the Italian and French cities, they start to paint English cities. <laughs> and the career of Turner is all about making the English see the wonderful at home rather than seeking it abroad. His translation from being an artist of an idealized European world to being the artist of a very real city. It's again transformation. And it's no accident that he meets the main coastal river scenes with battle pictures. And the playing up of an enormous level of national debt. Again, the end of the war, the British had a debt of 800 million, which was 200% of GDP. And it expanded from the 1815, not when it was actually in Europe. In Europe, three times GDP. And they spend the whole of the 19th century dealing with that. So the consequences of this war are not just the obvious ones. Gladstone is still worried about this in the 1890s. The debt did not start to come down until the early, early 1890s. And it came down to about 600 million. By then, the population had quadrupled, the economy had massively increased, and it was now well under 20% of the GDP. So the government is taking a huge risk on success. Paying at massive levels of debt. So if they lose, they're never going to be able to get back. And investing in that debt is a tremendous demonstration of faith in the stability of the country and the government. And so all of that work that 
Okay, let me just summarize that comment uh, for everyone at home. And I think what uh, Professor Lambert did was demonstrate uh, very effectively that, yeah, and as he said it himself, everything changed, right? So this, this question about what, what changed uh, could go on and on and on because everything, uh, everything changed. So thank goodness we have uh, this study uh, to base that lifetime of research, but we don't have a lifetime of time now because we need to thank our speaker, we need to have a glass of wine. So if you would, please all join me in thank you. Thank you to everyone at home. Uh, I will. Thank you, everybody at home. Thank you.